at the back of the forum. So, it's time to get started with shaking up television from web TV to user generated content. I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of that panel, Gary Hatch, who is the Chief Executive Officer of ATCI. Gary? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, I, I'm one who can look back a little ways to the NAB. Uh, my first NAB was 1983, so I thought we were shaking at that time. So, you know, hopefully we can really shake it. Um, when I looked at the television industry coming into the marketplace, you know, I thought the satellite, you know, areas were you know, a big bonanza. I still believe that because of the distribution that we're able to do. Now today we have the web, something we never really even thought about. But when we look at it, it really comes down to get the data, understanding data, how that works. Everything we do is related to usage algorithms, things such as that. But it is my uh, pleasure to uh, additionally introduce uh, those on the panel. Uh, Right here to my right, I have Tony Wynn, uh, who I've gotten to know very well. Tony and I sit on the uh, Southern California uh, uh, SSBI board together and look at ways to uh, you know, in, enliven our markets out there in, in, in many different areas that are involved here as well. Sorry to interrupt you. Is this, we're suddenly in the wrong session. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. But uh, along with Tony... Um, Tony's with uh, Ascent Media, Vice President of uh, Engineering and uh, Operations, and uh, they do a wonderful job on a whole myriad of things that he'll talk to you about to some point. Uh, Roger Franklin, Crystal Computer Corporation, uh, President and CEO, and, and uh, those guys do a lot within uh, automating our industry and what we do, uh, be it satellite or broadcast, and uh, add a lot to this panel. Jerry Caulfield, Principal Analyst, uh, Converging Markets and Technologies, Instat Magazine. Uh, Division of Reed uh, Business and Information Systems in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, close to where I live. And Jerry and I have been on other panels, talked about the future of television, kind of where things are going. So uh, let's see. I'll bring this up. And, and just our topic here, television has long been a one-way medium, which producers produced and consumed and, uh, and, and, and obviously the consumers consumed. Today, digital technologies from DVR to web are turning the business uh, around and moving a lot of different directions. In this session, we're going to explore those areas on kind of where web channels uh, are going, uh, how new channels uh, are converging within the television sector, and uh, really what search means uh, in and around that. Obviously, DVRs have, 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 have changed our market tremendously. I just have a few slides here that uh, I'm going to go through quickly, some uh, you know, relating to areas that, uh, we, where we've been. And this is kind of where, where we were. And not long ago, we were right here. And uh, it's kind of the way things worked at one time. Today, things are a little bit different. Uh, in my company, we deal um, with cable operators. We serve uh, through our processing systems about 53 million cable TV subscribers. And in and around that, we're looking at voice data video and the related services to that. I, I think what really drives markets will be the revenue tiers. Uh, you know, here's a kind of a basic IPTV revenue tier, the basic equivalent cable. See where all this comes down to. You look at ad revenues as being a big driver there. And of course, when we look at cable modem services, tremendous amount of profitability around there. We're, we don't pay Hollywood. Uh, for uh, internet services per se, uh, we just uh, uh, we amortize that equipment. Whereas on the video side, 53% of every direct recurring dollar uh, goes to you know Hollywood uh, production things of that nature. Those costs. So this is a typical pathway that we go through, even on uh, kind of a, a path, uh, be it in the internet, uh, be it to some extent even on the uh, television production side and uh, adding the metadata pieces there. Let's see if I can have it. But uh, one of the things that um, you know, becomes very evident to me as I look at voice data video is that search becomes everything. You know, advertising, as we set advertising, uh, we're looking at usage algorithms, behavioral patterns. We're looking at ways to go back to that uh, average revenue per unit and really figure out how we're going to derive uh, 
you know, the, uh, the result, which would be a higher value there, especially on the subscriber side. But truly, we do. We are what we search, and we pattern that. And we cross, uh, we, we create a cross-platform understanding in that. And those are things that we see as the internet grows. It's not just what we're seeing on the uh, television. It's also how we're using the internet. And in the cable system, we're obviously looking at internet usage against what we're seeing on the patterning on the set-top box, on the cable TV set-top box. As you can see, just even in the Americas, we have a tremendous amount of growth in, in, in many different areas. I thought it uh, was of interest that uh, uh, Japan alone has more internet users at 76 million than almost all of uh, Latin America. So there, 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 there's a lot of growth in Latin America. We're seeing that across the many different platforms. Um, internet penetration. Obviously, we have tremendous penetration here. The world is, is, is just really coming around. 73% of, of all of the video, or, or of the internet, 73% uh, of all the internet uh, usage is in the video space, so it's a tremendous driver. Um, obviously, you see this, uh, how we rate uh, here internet users in the Americas compared to the rest of the world. So you know, there, there's quite a bit of uh, growth yet to be made. And when I look at what's happening, there's growth. I mean, tremendous growth. It's, it's, it's very difficult to figure out what's going to be a hit, what's going to happen, where things are, are going to move, and how that relates back to television viewers and, and those eyeballs. Obviously, more growth. And, uh, you know, this is just a, a, a real quick picture of what we're seeing on, on new websites. You know, when we look at machines talking to machines and, and really where things are going, we look at Web 2.0, Web 3.0, how does that relate back to television? It does relate in every way. And of course, what we see is everything that we do on television, we do through the web. And you know, what, what is the relationship between that? Where are people going? I think you look at Facebook today has more hits and you know, more users on a daily basis than you will see uh, in the internet uh, from that standpoint. So the growth is, 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 uh, is going you know, to, to, to in the areas that we haven't seen as of yet. Artificial intelligence, something that everyone should be keeping an eye on. Obviously, we see you know, a lot of growth there, but really it's metadata on top of metadata. It allows us to, to look at where the trends are, and, uh, and those trends are, are, are key when we say, what are people watching, what's changing, where, where is the market moving towards? I think virtual worlds is something that you know, is, is a future move, but we obviously see gaming as a, as a huge part of what's happening within the youth culture. How does that relate back to television? That's always what we're going to be looking at, especially in the cable markets, uh, you know, on the crash plat platform understanding. Mobile, and we're going to spend some time talking about mobile and where mobile, you know, will end up. And, of course, when you look at the rest of the world, it is a mobile sector. And, uh, you know, most broadband is delivered in mobile. Television is watched in mobile. And we're seeing a lot of different, uh, you know, opportunities within that. But in the end, it is the attention economy. And, and where is the attention? Where are the eyeballs? And, you know, when I, I look at what we're going to talk about here today, I think that, um, you know, something that is just evident is, you know, where are people watching their 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 communications today is it is it going to be on the handheld obviously we're watching traditional television today but there's a lot of time usage in front of monitors uh, on the internet side uh, just just to kind of get things going here tony i uh, wanted you to you know maybe we'll go through you talk a little bit about your company and you know what you guys are doing and and uh, maybe we'll try to you know go from there but go ahead and uh, talk about you know what what's happening at your market thanks gary um, basically, I work, uh, currently work for Ascent Media Group. Uh, we are a worldwide company. Uh, we have Ascent Media um, in Singapore and uh, in the UK, London. And here in the state, we, uh, we have a large uh, post-production, post-house and media uh, services in uh, California, Southern California, Santa Monica and Burbank. But we have one teleport there. And we do uh, network origination uh, from there too. And over on the East Coast, we have uh, Scent Media in uh, New York um, and uh, Minneapolis and uh, in Stamford, uh, Connecticut. So basically, uh, at Scent Media, we, we do everything from A to Z, everything from uh, creating a, f a film uh, production film processing to uh, restoration 
uh, into uh, telecine process, you know, video editing, and all the way to content distribution uh, over to satellite broadcast and uh, internet and fiber. So you name it, uh, all of that service, our company providing that. And uh, basically, um, that's in a nutshell what the Scent Media uh, do doing up to today. Yeah, Scent is uh, definitely, uh, you know, when you talk about play out, automation, ad insertion, um, when you guys look at uh, internet today, how, how do, when you look at a cross-platform understanding, how do you derive kind of a, a, a future services uh, understanding? Is there anything that you're doing out there? In that regard? Yeah, well, you know, I, I manage a facility um, uh, in Burbank where we do broadcast with origination for linear channel. We're currently on the air with five um, uh, linear networks. Um, from time to time, we have clients that, you know, with, uh, you know, content owner, uh, programmer come to us, want to launch new networks um, over the satellite. And, you know, the bandwidth on the satellite, you know, as we all know, it's pretty expensive. You know, network origination is not, uh, not something that, uh, that cheap. Um, so a lot of time when people get the, uh, the quote and all that and uh, they face some financial issue and then they, some that can be able to finance and, and they can launch in the network, we, we uh, help those people. And there, there are some people that they, they face a financial and they can't be able to launch. So they have content, but they can't be able to launch. And then some of those, either they're going to wait for the op opportunity to have enough money to launch uh, via satellite, or some of them starting to launch via uh, fiber. Some of them starting to look at it, uh, launch it on internet television. And so we, as a service provider, we realize that that's a market that we need to provide to, to our clients to help those people who has content that they can't be able to launch using the satellite or any other means, but in the meantime, they want to get their content out there first. So we provide that technology and the means to help those people, you know, and starting with uh, provide the technology best of breed to help those people to uh, encode their content for, for web and provide the, the vehicle for them to, to, to uh, deliver their content to the distributor, such as, you know, YouTube or, you know, um, Hulu and, and you know those those company that uh, also we 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 also create a platform that um, using technology that you can help people to ingest once and distribute it across all the platform. Yeah, kind of re That's replicate it. That exactly. Kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, you know, as a as a service provider, we are pretty much uh, agnostic to technology. We we. We have to provide, we, we, we realize that, you know, we have to be agnostic in providing best of breed technology that compatible and help our client to deliver content across multiple platforms. Yeah, well that's, and, and I think it'll be very helpful for, with what we're discussing here is people, you know, how to launch a channel. What medium are we going to use? You know, that's really the big question sometimes. Jerry looks at this, when you talk about get the data, that's what he's all about, is looking at data and really trying to figure out trending of data. Jerry, maybe talk to us a little bit about what your day's like as you look out into cable television, you look out into television broadcast, into the internet space and into mobile. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for being here. Yeah. And uh, my name is Jerry Caulfield. I'm with Instat. I'm based in Scottsdale, Arizona. You can check us out on the web at instat.com uh, or Google my name. I always show up. But we've done quite a bit of extensive consumer surveys looking at uh, uh, how people are approaching what we call the three screen experience and it turns out that television especially high definition television is probably a one screen experience people who love to watch HD sports do not really want to watch it on a cell phone or a computer unless they're at the office and that brings up uh, when I mentioned the office they're a very successful online service Hulu but a lot of their viewers are watching at lunchtime from their own office and if they find a piece of the show that's funny they pause it and they go get their friends from the other cubicles and bring them in so it turns out that in our research and some of the research some of the other media companies have done what we're discovering is that some of the so-called over-the-top video services like Hulu and YouTube are being viewed at times when the person's not in their home 
So they're not necessarily stealing eyeballs away from a cable service. When you get home and you turn on your HDTV set, you're watching your cable service. When you're at school or at the office, you're watching Hulu on your PC. Uh, and then the other thing we found is that people want to use their mobile devices to blend with content and contacts that they have on their PC. They like to have access to MySpace and Facebook and those kind of things between their PC and their mobile device. So TV is still basically on television. And in fact, Advertising Age just had a, a fairly large uh, cover story about uh, something like 80% of the advertising that's seen in the world is still coming over television. So television still has a long way to go. But the other interesting thing, and this goes to, to some of the things that we're, we're talking about on this panel, in a recent consumer survey we found by different age groups, but something like 40% of men under the age of 40 simultaneously multitask, they watch their HD TV set while they have a laptop in their, in their lap and they're surfing, some of them are surfing the web, but a good percentage of them are actually tuned in to a website that's related to the program that they're watching. And then conversely, for females, 30% of women under the age of 30 are also typically multitasking with a laptop while they're watching TV. And it turns out right here at the NAB show, uh, there's a company called Harris Broadcast over at the uh, North Hall, I think it's N2502, huge booth, they have a product called Dynacast. And what that does is it lets a broadcaster, like somebody's watching the, the Masters, it's on TV. When uh, Tiger comes up to hit a shot, they can send a, a trigger from the time code on that piece of video to the PGA.com website. If you're logged on to the PGA.com website with your laptop and you're watching, that trigger from the, the Master Control Center flip something on the URL at the PGA.com and all of a sudden you get to see the view from the tee box with information about the, the hole and the, the, the shape of the cut and, and the distance and things like that. So they're actually tying content from the broadcast in real time to what's on the internet. And this is the really amazing part about this. There's no new infrastructure. It's basically a free bonding of a broadcast signal with what you're watching on the internet. So we start to see things like that happening, and when there's no new infrastructure involved, that sets the stage for things to really get shaken up. Yeah, you know, when you talk about that cross-platform understanding, you know, and it really is, what do they want? What are they watching? When are they watching it? What's the trend? Because you can always bring that content if you know where, what the trend is, if you know what the behavioral pattern is. And of course, we call that quality of service. It's QoS. Some people call it surveillance, but you know, whatever. It, it, it certainly helps us pay the freight. I think one thing to understand in the, in the advertising business is people sometimes don't want you to watch what they're watching. But they also don't want to pay very much either. But somebody has to pay the freight. I mean, that, that's what advertising really allows us as broadcasters and uh, video suppliers to do. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way it works. And maybe in the future there'll be a way to block it out and just pay big fees without paying for the advertising. But right now it's part of our business model. It's part of our value chain. But very interesting, Jerry. I think those are great things. Roger, you know, talk to us a little bit about you know your insights as a Roger's a CEO of, of Crystal Computer, and you know you guys have been in and around a lot of studio buildouts, different things, you know, across our marketplace, and provide some insights a little bit on your company, what you guys are doing. Crystal was founded in 1986, so we've been around the video industry for 23 years now. Um, and Crystal provides management solutions for content ingest and content distribution. The customers are the who's who on the cable channel, the ABC, the ESPN, the Fox, the CNN, the, the Viacom properties, it just goes on. Um, and what, what I'm seeing happening with the web right now obviously impacts my business, impacts my customers, and the bottom line, Gary's right about advertising, is if they don't get advertising dollars, they don't stay in business, and that's what they need. And, and what we're looking at now is how do we continue to leverage the content that these customers have and produce 
in order to increase the ad revenues through different distribution channels. There's, we've seen a slide with the, the many number of different distribution channels from cell phones, web broadcast, streaming video, cable TV, direct to home, they're, they're, they keep expanding. And the trick is to, to leverage existing content, provide focused ads for people who are viewing it, and that's one of the powers Jerry talked about with the, when you're watching content over the web, it's a two-way street, the content providers and the content relayers have a much better idea of who's watching that content, they understand the demographics of that, of that viewer, and can then provide local advertisement specific for that viewer that they know that viewer will be interested in. The, uh, the cost per conversion of advertising dollars spent on traditional television broadcast is, is much higher than the cost of advertising dollars spent for web content where you have a much better idea of who's viewing the content at that time. That's good, yeah, I, you know, the, you think about you know, a, a production house coming to you and uh, in their business model today, you know, without a doubt, one of the questions that uh, will come up is, you know, we have content, we have a thousand hours of, uh, of programming and uh, in our case it might be, you know, uh, niche programming in hunting and fishing or it might be in uh, Latin American sports programming, something of that nature, telenovelas, you know, whatever. But at the same point, what's your web strategy? I mean, not just, not just a commercialization strategy, but exactly what Jerry's talking about. How do we meld those together? How do we cross over into that platform? Because we want retention. Retention is so critical. I mean, one of the biggest issues we deal with in, in media as a whole to the subscriber is churn, you know, churning from one place to another. But we find, you know, statistically, that when people use many different platforms, similar to what Jerry was saying, they stay. Because they get the background information. It's kind of like baseball. You know, baseball to many people is baseball. But there's a game within a game. You guys are tracking stats. They're doing different things, similar to what you're saying on golf. They're looking at the bio of the caddy. What school did he go to? Did he get thrown out of high school? Whatever it was, you know. Different things are happening that really, you know, help people become part of that channel. And when you talk about how do you launch a channel, Tony Wynn knows how to launch a channel. And, uh, you know, I know you've been through the process, but how, how do you guide people ar around the web today as it relates to, you know, I, they have a library of a thousand hours of programming. What, how does Ascent deal with that? You know, when, when, when you say you've got to include the web on this in some way, shape, or form. Well, first of all, there's, there's client out there, like you say, uh, that uh, content programmer that owns thousand of asset, you know, whether it's sitting in a uh, tape format, most of them, you know, sitting in a tape format. And, uh, you know, in order to transition from, you know, uh, a uh, nonlinear or linear channel network launch into a web TV launch, I mean, somehow you have to convert that a asset, you make that transition to go from, you know, an analog into a digital and turn that into a web compatible uh, media file, digital file that's compatible with not just you know the web, but you know as you see one of the s second slide uh, earlier that you see multiple devices. And as um, um, Jerry referring to um, uh, earlier, that uh, you know we we not just watching the one screen, the TV screen, the the PC and the cell phone anymore, but now people, you know, multitask. I, I don't know how many eyeballs well, they have, but they at the same time, they're watching multiple platforms at the same time, and, and that's what the younger generation now, you know, kind of tune their eyes into. And so, in order to launch um, a network, whether you um, uh, do it in linear mode or do it in um, a web TV mode, you have to, uh, it, it's very crucial to uh, convert your media asset from an analog format into digital for, for two reasons. One is the, the first main thing that people um, do in that is to preserve the asset because the asset sitting in an analog format, sitting in the shelf, you have 
multiple box. You have a lot of shelves there. You don't. When you want to look at something, you have to hire a, a, like a, a, a tape operator or somebody to manage that that uh, library and go through and search for that. You know, but if you convert that asset into a digital format where you can do you know search using search engine uh, web browser, you can search anywhere. You can locate that. You can monetize that. You can repurpose your uh, your your content. And then the next thing, the, the final stage is that you distribute it to across multiple platforms. That's where you that's where you're gonna uh, you, get your money payback. And wouldn't you say you know what's really transforming things? How we use metadata how the machines talk to the machines. Because we have many, in many cases throughout the libraries, we have a lot of archive content, but it's, it's different. And so the ability to create usage around that metadata. So we put metadata around that video, and then we're able to use that and analyze it against the uh, internet usage that, that we see. And I think, you know, when, you know, when Jerry's talking about you know, what would come up on that screen, well, you know, that, that's important. If you think of the Amazon model or the uh, Netflix model against the Blockbuster model, Netflix came up with suggestions. They had algorithms of usage. They took your metadata and they applied it back to your IP address. And, you know, that's something we're starting to see in the media side is that we're, we're bringing that information from the Internet. We're crossing it over. We're, we're actually paying for that information from people like Hitwise, and we're looking at ways to trend that information. And I know, Jerry, you do this at, at Instat. You know, you look at metadata, and you look at the, the actual behavioral patterning that's going on. How does that change maybe where we see things going as it relates to future channels and maybe usage? Boy, that's a heck of a question. Metadata is very important, and there's so many different types of metadata, but I'm glad you brought it up. Because yesterday, Adobe and the CEO of Adobe and the chief technology officer, Bud Albers, of uh, the Digital Interactive Group, uh, Disney Interactive Group, were talking about an approach that Adobe has called the Open Screen Initiative. And because a lot of uh, Hollywood and television productions are already designed and built using Adobe's creative suite, so Adobe is in place at the time the production originally gets made. They've announced two new products called Adobe Story and Adobe On Location. So when someone's creating the story, this program automatically tags things like who's on the scene, what are they wearing, what scene is it, what set is it on, uh, who are the actors, what are the characters' names, and that all gets embedded into metadata right at the beginning of building the story. When they go to On Location to shoot the scene, They've already got the schedule set up with this scene requires this furniture in the room, these wardrobe things on the actors, these actors in place, and here's how it goes. So they can reduce the cost of doing the production because from the get-go there's metadata helping them organize it, but then it really gets powerful when they get to, okay, now we're ready to go to the internet. Now think about this, and they showed an application where there was a word, somebody mentioned the word jet lag. In, in a, one of the Miley Cyrus movies. Well, that's now a searchable piece of metadata because it's tied directly to the time code on the video where that scene occurs. So now you go do a search for Miley Cyrus and then you'd say, I want to know when she says jet lag and they can literally bring up the video instantly and they don't have to search the video because with this new approach, from the time the program is getting built, all of those hooks are being built into it. Because one of the problems that Disney has is with their huge library, if they've got to go through everything they've already made and manually tag it with all this information, that's a, that can be a one-time project that they do for the next five years. But they're actually really excited about being able to produce all their new content with all of these layers of metadata built in from Jump Street, and then they don't have to go through it when the product is done and ready to ship all of these features that we require to be able to discover the piece of content we're looking for are already built into it. So I think uh, if you get a chance, go over and check out the Adobe booth and ask them about the open screen initiative. To, to, you can take that one step further as well. You, the, the information about the clothes they're wearing, the furniture in the room, it's in the meta, metadata. Well, all you need to do now is if somebody's watching that program they're interested in those clothes, 
the metadata is there to take them to the retailer that can sell them those clothes right then and there. And now you've got you've got the advertisers involved in the content, and you, the DVRs and the, some of those issues where you're skipping advertisement become non-issues. And that's where that's where the advertising dollars will end up coming from in the future, because people want to see the content. They don't want to see the advertisers. They want to see the content, but they, if they like what they see, wherever they see it, they want to be able to buy it, and that gives them the ability to do that. Yeah, well, one of the things to, to keep in mind, I think, it's something I look at. I, I look at Comps, uh, Comcast cable uh, valuation on Comcast sitting at about uh, $55 billion, and then uh, you know, revenue is probably pushing at about uh, $30 billion in that range you know, through their other companies, I guess. And here we're sitting with Google, you know, it, it may be 18 billion, something in that range, uh, with a market cap still hovering around $100 billion. What is the difference between those two? One has massive infrastructure, fiber optic networks everywhere. They own, they own the subscriber. That's how I used to, when, when I worked for Liberty Media, that's how we valued things. We valued it by the subscriber. Google? You know, they have, they have search, they have different things, of course, but they know what people are watching it, when they're watching it, how they're watching it. You can create these models. And, you know, even though we're, we're questioning analysts today <laughs> heavily, you know, you know, one, one thing, when we have all these great processing tools, remember, computers don't ask questions. So, you know, we, it's, it's for us to really look at the data and, and process that. But the valuation on Google and, and those companies like them is right. And I think, yeah, I think it's a good point. You're bringing up, you know, we have raw, unrefined, archived data. How do we process that? How do we create metadata on top of metadata? Fortunately, we have Penta computing systems to do that and, and algorithms that allow us to do that kind of processing, which takes us into another realm of uh, cross-strapping that back into the Internet world. But, you know, when I look at uh, BBC, I think they're a good model. They process 100 different channels. And, in that, and they're, they're going back through their archives and adding metadata strips on all of that. So they'll go back on their IP stacks and they, 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 do, they do kind of a cross-reference indexing on that. But on that, on the fly, they do facial recognition, voice recognition. They, they go back and create related stories throughout the Internet. And then they archive all those stories in there. And then they do long-term, short-term. And I think those are areas that, you know, you're seeing that through people like IOCO and Autonomy. They're really some of the companies of the future in this industry because of their ability to index over and over data. And I don't know, you know, when, when we talk about technology that changes things, I mean, that's something I'm seeing that really changes the libraries that we already have, and then what we'll do with the future to apply them to applications that people really want to watch. I don't know what technologies you're seeing specifically, maybe in the, on the floor here, that uh, turn you on. <laughs> Tony, but let us know what's, what's getting you started. And Tony has a long history of that. So. Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, technology that is really interesting, uh, especially here at the show like this, you know. Um, I go back to the network launch and all that, and, you know, we, we've seen, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, people come to me and say, well, you know, I want to launch a new network, and here's the content. Well. There's a lot of questions uh, that needed to ask. You know, uh, you know what kind of uh, you know what kind of tape format that you have. You know, then you know uh, what kind of traffic system you have. You know, do you require graphics? Uh, you know, network bugs and all of that. And after you know the client give you all that uh, prescription, and all of that for you to go shopping, then you put together you know a whole list of capex and. Uh, you know, money is just like uh, it's uh, a lot to come out to be, you know, really big uh, money to be in, in invested into that. But now, you know, a lot of companies come out with uh, technology like what they call referring to like network in a box. And, you know, you have uh, one box that pretty much, if you want to launch just a single network that be able to display. You know, uh, network bugs, uh, graphics pop up, you know, squeeze back, play out, and all of that. You know, you, you can find technology now that at least, you know, I counted in my hands, it's a multiple company like that. Harris is one of them that he's referring to, 
there's uh, uh, Probel, which is no, now it's Neil Wilcox. There's uh, Omnion. There's uh, uh, Miranda. Uh, there's uh, Omnibus. So there's a lot of technology out there that allow us to to get there and and don't have to spend a lot of money. Now, uh, going back to the the point that uh, you know, converting an asset from analog to digital. And doing that process, you know, definitely you have to attach met metadata in there. And back in the day, a few, a few years ago, a couple of NAB years ago, when we, when the digital asset management was a, a huge talk of the town at the time, right? And a lot of company come out with that that project. A lot of company hire uh, professional consultant coming in and create proof of concept, and they spend million of dollars. Come some some company spend million of dollars in investing into hardware and software and all that and uh, and then at the end uh, some made it some you know just have the product there sitting there and nobody using it why because after they converted the 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 asset uh, from analog to digital uh, they forgot to factor the, the the main factor in there that you have to hire a group of people sitting there and lock in the metadata I mean <laughs> you know how do you know, you know, in, in that tape, you know, what part that, uh, you know, the, the talent or what do you need to search for if nobody's sitting there and locking all of that metadata into an asset? So if an asset not associate with a metadata and there, it's a dead asset and there's no use for it. Yeah, so. it, it, it is interesting. What is an asset? What is not an asset? Well, if you can't use it, it's not an asset, correct? It has no use. So it's, it's, it's better off on the shelf. In, in, in 2002, it was a ghost town walking around after 01 uh, in this convention. It was very light traffic. And um, at that time, it was post dot bomb. And I, I, I kind of thought about it. I said, what's happening? We have, a lot of, uh, we have a lot of business plans out there. Great business plans. Amazing. I mean, <laughs> you had VCs calling, could you create a business plan? Anything. We can fund anything. Uh, you know somebody from Stanford in the physical education department? We can fund him. I mean, it didn't matter. You know, you know. I mean, do you know somebody who works close to Stanford? You know, or Cal Berkeley? We can fund it. At that time, I thought the business plans were ahead of the technology, and it kind of proved. You know, I, I saw all this fluff coming forward. I actually believe, and I, Jerry, I, maybe comment on that. Is the technology seemingly it's ahead in some ways? of what we're seeing on the business plan side. Uh, I would disagree. I think we saw that over the last three or four years. But, but I think in this, because of the economic downturn, and we're hopefully it's going to bottom out later this summer and start to turn positive by the end of uh, 2009 and going into 2010. But right now, what's happening is because consumers are sort of standing pat. We've done several surveys about how they plan to cut spending and about uh, the average consumer is looking at trying to save 15 to 20 percent of their total household spend but of that group only 15 percent of consumers are going to try to lower what they're spending on broadband service mobility or pay TV so those three groups are still fairly recession proof when people are home they're watching TV if they're looking for a job, they're online using their broadband connection. And if they're not at home, they don't want to miss a call, so they've got their mobile service. So we're seeing people actually realizing that the technology and the entertainment value and the connection value of these services is holding up. Uh, but, but what I will say is that, like I mentioned with this, this uh, Dynacast product from Harris, is that they can deliver things today that, that connect the TV to the Internet in your living room on your laptop and there's basically no new infrastructure. So as you walk around the show floor, what you want to look for is things that can, can offer a service provider new opportunities with basically no new infrastructure. And uh, one company that comes to mind is Fujitsu, which is uh, over in the, the South Hall on the upper deck in room uh, or booth 10921. And they've got uh, the IP 9500 and IP900 MPEG-4 uh, video codec. And what they're doing in Japan with this is they're doing contribution level video capture at sporting events, running 20 megabits per second, 
back to a studio over the public internet. So this is a, a way for a company to start bringing in more product and more video at really low cost. And then there's also a group right on the upper level of the South Hall as you walk in on the left. There's a little yellow booth. I think the name of the company is a bit broad or something like that. I, I don't have the exact name. But they've got a remote studio in a box. It has a camera input. It has a, an MPEG-4 encoder. And it uses two cell phone data cards to deliver an 800 kilobit per second video signal back to a TV station or a newspaper or a website. So and the, the box, I think, retails for $12,000. And then you pay 65 bucks a month to have it hooked up. Well, now if I'm a TV station or, or a, a Discovery Network or anybody else who's doing remote uh, electronic news gathering, I, I might have had $50,000 invested in a van, $50,000 worth of equipment in the van, an engineer in the van driving it, a piece of, t you know, a talent to, to do the show. Well, with this new box, the person goes out, sets the camera up on a tripod, stands in front of it. Basic, it's got two buttons. You plug in the camera, you push the on button, and you're on the air back to the station. And the, uh, it, so the amount of content that can be produced with these new tools is going to be phenomenal. There's actually a TV station in San Francisco that's hired 30 reporters and given them each one of these boxes and sent them out. So the TV station's not only creating a lot of content for their news and their local talk shows, they're populating their website with all sorts of community activities and building up an audience online. And some of the TV stations are seeing 40% per year revenue growth from last year to this year on their websites. So even though advertising to the TV stations is down 20%, they're seeing tremendous growth on their websites because they have all this new specialized content that's low cost, there's lots of it, and they've got people out there getting it for them. So I think coming into 2010, we're going to see the technology the consumer interest and the business models start to converge, and 2011 is going to be the year I think it all starts to really take off. Yeah, that's very interesting. Roger, what do you think? You know, we're, we're sitting here in this era, you know, we see this technology, as Jerry's talking about, see lots of it, lots of capability. And, you know, what we're looking for, you know, as an entrepreneur myself, yeah. starting a few businesses, starting this business I'm in today, you know, it's really about belief and ideas. You know, and that's what it's all about. Now, you know, where are we from your standpoint? I, the technology's there. It's just yeah. a matter of pulling it all together, putting it in a format that the average consumer can use. You don't have to be a techno geek to figure out how to use all this stuff. Like I said, push the on button, you go. Um, and and it's, it's present. It's just a matter of somebody's got to package it, somebody's got to market it right, somebody's got to work the contracts with the content providers. Um, there are copyright issues that may need to be settled. But overall, I mean, the technology is there to, to provide a very clean, integrated content viewing solution at every level, from the cell phone to the big screen TV in the house. And content coming over the cable, coming over the satellite, coming over the web, wherever it comes from, we've got the technology to do it. It's just a matter of now making it happen. Making it happen. You know, I, I think... Uh it's so important. You know, why are we here at a convention such as the NAB? We're really here to rally together ideas. We, we meet as human beings. It's really machine with machine. We come up with new ways to use applications. It's phenomenal. But what I like about the web is it's an easy start. When we have to put somebody up on satellite, even on a cable channel, it, it, the whole value chain of monetization is, is extreme. I think you know, while I'm talking here, I'll try to bring one up that I, I have. Let's see, I'll go the right way. But, you know, when I think of DTH and, and the value chain around DTH, let's see if I've got one here. I thought I had one back here somewhere. Maybe not. Oh, here it is. So, you know, this is what we're talking about within a, a direct to home value chain. I mean, it, takes you, it took me two years to do our ESAT model, you know, just to model it out, <laughs> get all the advertising. You know, a, a group of guys can come in from uh, 
college, uh, you know, where I live at Arizona State University, they can have a concept on political blogging, and we can start it quickly. You know, we can obviously grow it, but it, it gives everybody, I, I'm talking idea guys, it gives them a chance. And, uh, you know, you're always looking for ways to do that. You say, start that channel on the web. We'll bring it to you. We have a lot of professionals that know how to do this. This is what we do. But, you know, when I go back to all those websites I showed earlier, I mean, that, that, uh, that just shows you. That was, I caught that on two different days. And those were all new websites. So, you know, I, I think the thing we need to do is really encourage that that cross-platform is here, that we can get through these value chains. And they're extensive. I mean, a lot of us have had a lot of experience in different businesses through this. And eventually you get there with a the success. Obviously, it has to be a hit. But we can meter that hit. We can watch where those trends are going. And when you look at the trends, what trends are you seeing out there? And I'll ask that to each of you. And I know we're getting close on time. What trends do you see really happening you know, within the markets that uh, you know, maybe gets you excited on, on, on kind of where this market can go and how you would talk to somebody coming into the business on where they can go and what they can do? Well, to me, the uh, trend out there that in the future is that uh, like Roger said, I mean, the, the, the technology platform are available today. That's not an issue. Issue is uh, how do we get together and, and come up with a, um, you know, for a content provider, uh, a content uh, creator, the, the going forward, I see that they have to change the way how they produce uh, their production that, uh, you know, First of all, people think that you know web TV is you know when if you haven't watched it, you thought that you know when referred to watch something on 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 web, you think that you know a poor quality and stuff like that. Well, that's not that's not the the, the right way of thinking of now. That you know people tend to demand more quality production uh, to be viewed on on the web, and so uh, more of the um, television networks. Now we all know that the TV networks would never go away. You know that's <laughs> that's going to stay there. So uh, how going forward that they're going to be able to work with the web TV to take advantage of that opportunity to deliver streaming networks like ABC or ESPN or those big network streaming their content on the web uh, or CNN. You you know you can see all that major network on the web TV, you, if you don't have TV. And, and the, the people now tend to spend more time on their computer than watching their TV at home. You know, uh, people think that, you know, uh, the web TV is gonna kill the TV, you know, business altogether, but it's not. You know, uh, like take the, Olymp the Olympics uh, 2008 in Beijing, for example, people w use web TV to drive more viewer into a television set. You know, you, you can use web TV to watch highlights of the events and then you, then you have to go back and then you watch the, the, the TV network to, to see the whole thing. And then for some, you know, sport events, the same thing, music events, the same thing. You know, so um, to me, the, the trend in the future, what I see is that, you know, the, uh, it's not about the technology, it's about the, how we produce content that, that be able to deliver with high quality on the internet and also, you know, like some, like Disney, ABC, for example, they, they use a lot of syndicated programming. Um, you know, Desperate Housewife, a loss, and all that. Now you can watch it on on web TV, uh, syndicated program. And uh, the last piece is going to be the the advertiser. You know, you, you all know about the, you know the two, Hulu and and YouTube. The difference between the two is that, uh, you know. Hulu doing a good job. They create uh, content, and then they widely supported by ad sponsor. While YouTube, you know, using user created content, uh, a lot of people that with a camera can create content and post on YouTube. But uh, is that widely supported by uh, advertiser? Maybe not. So that's the two different, you know, uh, from what I research and I see uh, that. So. Um, yeah, Hulu is interesting. I mean, it's it's uh, taking the the entire market by storm, and especially within the youth movement. You know, I, I know in my case, my kids watch more television that way than they do 
uh, on a real television. So, Jerry, trends that you see kind of going forward. Oh, yeah. uh, well, one of know, the trends. How would you talk to somebody yeah. trying to get into this business right now? Anyway, yeah. Many people that will watch this are watching it through the web. And um, right. you know, a lot of them are, are sitting in university colleges, you know, maybe looking to transition into a different job. You know, how would you help them get into the business? Okay, well, as I said earlier, people are watching their laptop computer at the same time they're watching their high definition TV. And in most cases, the content coming to the high definition TV is coming from the same company that's bringing the broadband content to your PC. So the cable operators, even though there's all this talk, like you're saying, and their valuation is down, that they're in trouble, uh, I think their big opportunity is their next generation hybrid set-top box that lets them blend content from their video broadcast network in high definition with content that comes in over an IP connection to that same box. And think about this, if you're watching any kind of a, a program, even something like Lost, you could, you could, a lot of people would benefit by being able to hit a button that, that shrinks the HD picture into two-thirds of the screen and brings up information about the characters that are currently on the screen or the storyline that you're watching. Because I've tried to watch Lost and I can't follow it. I have to spend time on the darned website to figure out what I just saw. So if they could bring some of that content right into the picture, that would be good. But here's the real kicker, is if you've got a static bar on the screen, now you can start putting advertising up there without interrupting the program. So instead of going to a five minute commercial block where the picture goes away and you see commercials, if advertisers could find a way where they could bring their ad into the content without distracting too much from it, I think that's really powerful. So I think these next generation hybrid boxes that can combine the high quality HD content on your TV with static or graphics or animations from the internet, including the advertising, I think that turns out to be a win-win. The consumer gets a better experience. They still get their high definition. The advertisers get really good return on investment and high targetability. And when somebody does engage and hits the, the connect, show me more about this product, then the, the, the network or the service provider will get really high CPMs because these are really valuable uh, consumers when they click through something. So, and, and that's one of the things you've been talking about is this targeted advertising. So I think being able to get this two-way connection through this hybrid set-top box on your TV actually it creates a lot of revenue opportunities and that box does not yet exist. So if you're listening at UC Berkeley, start working on this box. Yeah, you know, it's really true. We need, the, we need everybody. We need everybody to collectively come together because for every window they say is closing, 12 new just opened up. Who can see them? And, you know, when I walked here through this thing uh, as a 22-year-old, you know, in 1983, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, I see 12, I see 15, I see 20 windows. And it's really all about the energy, no matter what age you're at. But what are you betting on? I, I know what it's like in business. Guys walk in with ideas, and you really have to finance them, in effect. You know, you're, 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 you're the man, and you sit down with people, and they have ideas, and then you're, you know, you're, you're working and, and motivating your sales teams. What are you betting on out there? The bottom line is, if if you got to be able to take those ideas and show how it can generate a profit in a short amount of time. Yeah. Period. The end. Uh, there, with the with the explosion of the web out there, a lot of consumers out there don't want to pay for anything anymore. How many people have Facebook accounts? You don't pay anything for that. That's the norm moving forward. The only way to get those companies profitable, and they have to stay profitable to stay in business, is at this point they've got to sell advertising. They either got to sell your demographic information, which nobody likes to hear, or they've got to, they've got to sell something to you when you're on there. And you talked about trends. Content explosion is a trend. Everybody's generating content. If you've posted anything on, the, on your Facebook or MySpace account, you're distributing content that you generated, whether it's a picture, a story, a video, whatever it is. And for those companies out there that enable the sharing and distribution of that content, 
and can monetize it through advertising somehow, targeted advertising, tar advertising within the content, those are the companies that will succeed in the future. Th that's looking forward. That's where I see this business going. The, 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 the TV we know today is still full of a lot of good content and con valuable, interesting content will always remain paramount. But at the end of the day, you still have to monetize it. You still have to get somebody to pay for it somehow. And as we all raised our hand, we're not paying for it because we want free. Yeah, it is interesting when you sit down with creative people. Uh, they've got great ideas. And then you have to break it to them. Sorry to tell you guys this, but we've got to make some money at this. <laughs> and uh, Tony and I had a discussion on, you know, you know where the money's made. And uh, it's unfortunate, but we've got to do that. You know, talking about Facebook, I thought it was interesting. Microsoft paid $580 million a year ago for 1% of Facebook. So somewhere there's a model out there that works. And, you know, that, that, that's the question. So we have to really think about it. I think we've had some good ideas here on, on really where things are going. But th today we're sitting at around a billion Internet users. And, I, you know, I, I, there will be another billion users. It took us from 1900, whatever, till what, 1975 to build out the telephone business, 30 years to build out the cable business, about 10 or 11 years to do the internet arena here in the U.S. So, you know, things are moving in maybe a different way, but in similar ways. You know, for 3,000 years we've had to make money by providing good services. And I think in the end of the day, that's the thing we, we stress, I know here, is provide a quality service and um, you'll get paid for it. And, and people will keep coming back. And those guys will figure out how to, hopefully, how to make money at Facebook. Because I love not, it. And not only are we working hard and making money, but I would still guess that in the media industry, we're still having a lot of fun doing it. So that's the key. Keep smiling. Yeah, exactly. Anything else, guys, here? Well, they've got big smiles. But we appreciate the time here. I know we've had, uh, you know, an interesting time just even preparing you know our thoughts and, and, and ideas around this so we look forward to seeing y'all next next year as well and uh, keep opening those windows they're out there all right bye-bye thank you Gary thank you.